We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is the one and only Rick Rule. Rick, how are you today? I'm fine, Tom. Thank you very much for having me back. I appreciate it. It's uh, always excellent to have you as usual. And we're going to focus today um, primarily on how you rate uh, equities in the in the gold and silver or, or mining space in general. So you've, you've been saying that investing in this space involves both hard work and luck. So why don't we start there and tell us about how you think about putting in hard work as an investor? Well, hard work involves... Uh, getting away from the narrative, uh, feeling less. If you're going to pay attention to the narrative, don't pay attention to how it makes you feel. Pay attention to how you think it's going to make the market feel. Uh, trading a narrative, uh, which is to say uh, trading a story's ability to move a market is a form of securities analysis. I need to say at the beginning of the exercise, I'm not very good at it. Uh, I haven't owned a TV for 35 years. Uh, I don't know how to dress myself without my wife's assistance. So probably my weak point in the system is, it a, is, is as a jur- journalist. But I note, after grading now 22,000 portfolios, uh, going back a little more than a year, that uh, for most people, most speculators, the narrative and the way that the narrative appeals to them is their... Uh, m- dominant form of stock picking, which is why most people get it wrong. If you're going to pay attention to the narrative, don't pay attention to how it makes you feel, except as a defensive mechanism. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to how you think it's going to make other people feel. Now, I don't take that very much into account in my rankings. I answered the question because you asked me in a sense. My, uh, My rankings are all about, and this is a very, very, very long phrase, which I'll try to define, probabilistic net present value calculations. In other words, uh, before I care too much about what uh, the price of a stock is and its market capitalization and its enterprise value, I want a sense of what it's worth. Uh, What it's worth today, which is to say its liquidation value, Mm -hmm. uh, and what I think it could be worth in a probabilistic sense, not a certain sense, 18 months from now, 36 months from now, 50 months from now. In my experience, money is made on the delta between what something is worth or likely worth and what it's selling for. And that's it. Mm -hmm. The magic in there is calculating net present value and understanding that there's no certainty. In other words, understanding that you're never going to get it right. You just have to get it more right than other people. Uh, And as news changes, your outlook for a company has to change. So let's say as an example, that uh, the company that we are ranking is a gold miner and they're in production and they have a deposit uh, that has uh, a million ounces uh, that we think is mineable. Uh, maybe some of it is in the probable category, but you know we understand from the dil- drilling density that it's highly likely to be upgraded uh, you know, into proven producing. And let's say just for fun, that they're producing this stuff at the rate of 100,000 uh, ounces a year. Uh, what you try to do is develop a model of the net present value of future cash flows. So you look at what the probable total production costs are, what the probable cost of capital uh, is, what the probable closure liability is. You discount at whatever rate you think is appropriate. I'm using 5% now. Uh, I use a number based on a LIBOR that floats, and you try and get a net present value calculation. In other words, what is the company worth if you had to liquidate it today? Too many people do liquidation value based on what companies with similar um, gross production statistics sell for in the market, which is to say they use comparative analysis. Mm -hmm. They do that because it yields a higher number and because it's easy but it's a worthless number really, except for the fact that it's a ubiquitous number. Um, so once you have uh, an, an expected value of future cash flows, and by the way, um, I usually use a pricing matrix 
uh, which is to say I'll run a $1,250 case. I'll run a case on, on the forward strip, uh, which is the market's estimate uh, of pricing. Mm-hmm. And I might run uh, an upside case. I might run a twenty-two or a twenty-five hundred dollar case, just so that I can do a what if. Then you need to uh, add in anything that are extraneous uh, or redundant assets. Uh, ironically, accountants treat cash as redundant. I've never found my cash to be redundant, but just for fun, you add cash back in and you add in to the extent that you can, and this is the art, uh, development projects. Uh, From this, uh, you take away uh, what you see as recourse liabilities, which is to say debt and closure obligations as an example, uh, likely sustaining capital uh, obligations. And what you end up with is a number that is, while uncertain, much more certain than a number that's available to other people because only one in a hundred people do this work. <laughs> uh, that's the basis of my analysis. The second part of my analysis very much involves the people. Mm-hmm. Once you know what it's worth, who are the jockeys? Are they going to make it worth more or are they going to make it worth less? Uh, there is a uh, a falsehood in this business that the rocks don't care who own them. Uh, in other words, a scoundrel uh, can have good rocks and make good money. The truth is that scoundrels can always find a way to either steal or diminish uh, the wealth inherent in geology. Uh, and very good guys uh, can take what you thought was a so-so deposit and make it into a very solid producer. So uh, it's very important for me that the people that are involved in this value proposition are high quality people and people whose value has been demonstrated in a task that is very closely related to the task at hand. I think I've said on your show before, if someone comes to me and says that he or she was a success in mining because they operated a producing gold mine in 2 billion year old Archean terrain in French speaking Quebec, but the task at hand is exploring rather than producing for copper gold in 15 million year old accreted terrain in Spanish speaking Peru, although both tasks are mining, they're completely, completely unrelated. So I want the task at hand to be familiar. In other words, I want the success that has been demonstrated uh, to resemble uh, very closely uh, the task at hand. I've also learned that I want partners, not employees. Uh, I want the officers and directors of the company to own a lot of stock. And I want them to own stock at a price that's somewhat related to mine. (laughs) You know, if somebody wrote themselves 100 million shares at a penny, and now I have the opportunity to buy a million shares at 50 cents, uh, while they have ownership, uh, the cover charge, if you will, the markup between the price that they paid for their stock and the price that I paid for my stock is too great for me to consider their ownership to be relevant Mm -hmm. uh, other than to say, yes, they have some incentive to succeed. But what they are doing is sharing disproportionately in the gain without sharing proportionately in the pain. That isn't the same as a partner. That's the same as a promoter. And I have no particular interest in that. Go ahead. You had a question? And yeah, absolutely. And it, it, exactly as you say, that, that really goes to show, let's say the incentives, because this, this world as when it comes down to it, as, as we think about it, is driven by incentives. So having that skin in the game is something, um, and not necessarily just having skin in the game, but how that how that position is structured is also very important, right? You know, Tom, uh, now that we're in a, in a bull market, again, in speculative issues, uh, people always send me these seed stage opportunities, mm-hmm. allegedly seed stage opportunities. And generally, it involves some project that they acquired for half a million bucks or a million bucks. Uh, And somehow, magically, they mark that up from the million dollars that they acquired it for to $20 million. And they're giving me the opportunity to buy stock at 25 cents at a $20 million pre-money valuation. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're they're looking for a 20-fold lift. When I was an active money manager... Uh, I got a 20% carry, a 20% lift, not a 200, not a, pardon me, not a 2000% lift. And I got it off an 8% hurdle, meaning that my investors had to make 8% cumulative and compounded before I got my lift at all. If I didn't give them the lift, I didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and people argue that I was excessively compensated. 
Uh, now uh, you have a coalition of butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and copywriters that uh, assign themselves $19 million worth of value out of a $20 million market capitalization. They're trying to do me a favor mm -hmm. uh, at a 25 cent seed level. Uh, truly insane. Mm -hmm. Truly insane. I don't blame so, them for trying, of course, but it's, uh, you know, it's up to me to use that wonderful word in English. No. <laughs> Seems very simple, right, Rick? People are governed by narrative. Uh, if people are attracted to gold uh, and a gold story comes across their desk, they pay attention to the narrative. They feel it. Uh, they, they pay attention to the fact that they're attracted to gold and they don't seem to go below the golden glow on the cover. Uh, to see all the sins hidden inside. So as, as we're talking about, let's say, uh, a producing gold miner, um, you've also talked a lot about answering the unanswered questions. And is that mainly, let's say, pointed towards discovery and um, trying to replace those um, ounces in the ground that are mined and diminished off the balance sheet every year? That is much more involved in exploration. Uh, but also, it may be that uh, the value proposition offered up is that the company has been uh, an inefficient producer, and they believe that with uh, some capital improvements that they can go from being an inefficient producer to being an efficient producer. That's an unanswered question. Uh, how much money is involved in sustaining capital uh, to get that done? How much time will it take? What is the probability of success? How will I know that they're succeeding? You know, if you take a, a hundred thousand ounce uh, a year producer and you take them down from a cash cost of, uh, let's say, uh, twelve hundred dollars an ounce, down to nine hundred dollars an ounce, uh, the net present value of uh, three hundred dollars an ounce over a hundred thousand ounces this year, uh, and a hundred thousand ounces a year for the next six or seven years makes an astonishing difference in net present value, but it's an unanswered question. They say they can do it. They believe they can do it. They're going to do it. Mm -hmm. What do you think the probability of, this, of their success is? What do you think the value of a yes answer is? How long will the period of indecision uh, be before you know if they've succeeded or failed? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the expected value of success relative to the time value of money and the cost of achieving that success. Um, all critical. And remember, you're never going to get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to get it more right than the other person, mm -hmm. uh, which is easy because most people, when you explain the process, say, oh, I better buy an ETF. <laughs> yeah, that uh, seems like a, a bit of a safer option. And, and I want to get to you know, building, let's say, safety into your portfolio. And, and uh, we'll, we'll touch on that later. But I think a, a good, let's say, example of a company that has recently, or, or not necessarily recently, but, um, you know, having a recent conversation with Keith Newmeyer, um, digging into some of the, the research in First Majestic, they have um, increased their efficiency of extraction of their ore by 10 plus percent over the last, I believe it was something like seven to 10 years. So is, is that um, an example, Rick, to you of, of a CEO that is able to increase efficiency and answer those unanswered questions? Yes. Uh, Keith is uh, a CEO that I was always willing to pay a premium for because he has chosen deposits well and he tells a story well, mm -hmm. uh, like Ross Beattie. Uh, telling your story well lowers your cost of capital. Uh, and that is an off-balance sheet asset that you have to pay for. What has impressed me with Keith is that he has bought uh, what occasionally I regarded was as old, tired mines, Sandemus, and proven me wrong. Uh, and, and there's nothing I like more than somebody proving me wrong in a positive sense, which is to mm -hmm. say a better outcome than I had anticipated. Understanding, uh, and Ross Beattie's done this too, understanding uh, that a large old legacy deposit that isn't performing hasn't been performing because it was starved for capital, because the sustaining capital investments weren't made, because people hadn't paid, people hadn't invested intellectual capital in understanding the, the genesis of the deposit and what was left in the deposit and righting those historic wrongs. Uh, I, I note that uh, Keith now has um, picked up Jarrett Canyon uh, you know, I mean, talk about a massive old legacy deposit. 
if he can do, and I'm not saying he can, don't get me wrong, I'm not touting First Majestic, but if you look at their historic success taking these large, complex, uh, allegedly over-the-hill deposits, uh, investing a lot of time, a lot of talent, and a lot of treasure turning them around, and then annuitizing the benefit uh, over the course of a decade, uh, he's a difficult guy to bet against. Absolutely. So something you just mentioned there, Rick, is is the into, the inventory of intellectual capital. And that doesn't necessarily just um, apply to evaluating a company. It also applies to looking at that entire company's team. So is it not just about, let's say, the, the CEO and, and his direction and vision? You uh, get people, by the way, I'm one of them, uh, who are very good um, purchasers of intellectual capital. I would say that my unsung advantage going back 40 years is I am very good at hiring geologists. I am very good at evaluating what their strengths and weaknesses are. And I'm very good at consuming the intellectual capital that they produce, understanding their strengths and their biases and weaknesses. And you, you get people, um, Bob Quartermain comes to mind, Ross Beatty comes to mind, Clive Johnson comes to mind, Robert Friedland comes to mind, Tom Kaplan comes to mind, A players, people who have been serially successful. And what you find is that they, just, they don't just hire good people. Mm -hmm. They hire good people whose skill sets are appropriate to the task at hand, and then they motivate them. They engender tremendous loyalty among these people, and they make great people even better. There's this sort of intangible leadership quality that you see around the best of the best players. I remember uh, some years ago when I was held in somewhat less favor by Robert Friedland, um, and he had a geologist who I won't name who worked for him. Uh, and, you know, Robert can be sort of volatile. And I said to this geologist, listen, how, I mean, how can you work for this guy? He calls you at two o'clock in the morning. He screams, he cusses, he berates you. He said, listen, <clears throat> uh, in my career as an exploration geologist, people for 15 years told me I had really good ideas and Robert drilled them. That's all I can ask for. When I failed, Robert said, okay, grieve, take the weekend off, give your head a shake. Uh, let's come back and make the money back. It was a really good idea. Never feel bad about failing on a real good idea. So th this isn't meant to be the sort of Robert Fr Friedland uh, praise weekend, but you find a, a consistency, be it Adolf or Lucas Lundin, Robert Friedland, they hire great people, they create an atmosphere within the company that's conducive to success. Uh, it, it's a skill set. Mm -hmm. So as, as you're talking about these, these great leaders, Rick, what are some questions that should be asked of a CEO of, let's say, an exploration or a mining company? Why did you hire your VP expl exploration? What was it about him or her that drew you to hire them? And why is it that their resume is suited to the task at hand? Uh, talk to me about your CFO. How does your CFO fit in that business plan? Did you hire this person from personnel agency? Uh, in other words, did you use somebody, did you need somebody who could add and subtract uh, and hire a CFO because the CFO was convenient? Or is there something about this CFO that made him or her uniquely suited to this. Tell me about the independent people on your board. Did you hire them just for their resumes? Uh, tell me what their role is. Tell me what they bring to the company. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your relationship with them. Uh, is there anybody on your independent board that has the courage to tell you that you're wrong? Uh, is there somebody on your board that when you are very lonely and you've made a mistake, you can go to as a mentor? who will buck you up, uh, you need to understand how the hiring decisions came about and how they relate to the task at hand. Very often, uh, when you ask these questions, the CEO will respond, oh, that's a good question. I never thought of it that way. And they're actually doing you a favor. Then you can throw the company away and you don't have to research it anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So how about the importance of, let's say, their their plan going forward, the importance of getting from A to B, Rick? Well, that's critical, particularly in the exploration stage, pre-production, uh, because fully 80% of the companies that I ask about with regards to a plan don't have one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very tough to get somewhere uh, if you don't know where it is that you intend to go. Basically, what you find with 80% of the junior listings is that uh, their chief plan is to be able to draw a paycheck in 18 months, uh, which I understand is relevant to them, but it doesn't matter much to me. Mm -hmm. So this is where the answering unanswered questions comes in. Uh, when you ask them, you know, for the sort of grand plan, uh, you know, I have this project I picked up in Peru, uh, exploration dates back to the 1700s. If the original mule hadn't died, the prospector would be a billionaire, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to end up being 500 million ounces of silver. Well, the first question is, why do you think that? Mm -hmm. Because you want to explain to me, uh, how the facts at hand, cause you to have that target. Um, sometimes they get an answer that's intriguing. Say, okay, so now uh, you add value to your company by answering unanswered questions. You add value to your company by uh, peeling away uncertainty the same way other people might peel an onion. Uh, what's the first unanswered question that will allow the market to understand more about your project? If this is a you know, a sort of a district scale project in Peru uh, is what you're going to do. Well, tell me what you're going to do. You're going to do a variety of surface samples so that you can come up with a grid that will give you a target size. Or if you've already done that, uh, are you going to do a trenching program to see whether or not the mineralization extends at depth? Uh, if you have already done a trenching program, uh, are you going to throw the truth machine at it? Meaning, are you going to drill it? Tell me how you're going to answer the unanswered question. Tell me your thesis and tell me how you developed the thesis and tell me how you're going to propose to test the thesis. Most of them can't do that, mm -hmm. uh, which as I say, really does me a favor because then I don't have to listen anymore. I just mm -hmm. throw them away. Then, uh, you know, for that sort of 20% who has actually thought about answering the unanswered questions, uh, I make them do management one more time. Uh, I say, like, tell me why I should care about your thesis. Tell me what it is about your background that gives you the expertise that I ought to want to listen to your thesis. If they do that, I say, okay, I really like that answer. Thank you. And I like, I, I, I like the sequence. I like everything. Tell me how you're going to know that you failed. You have a $10 million budget. Are you going to drill $10 million? Or are $3 million of the way into it? Are you going to understand that your thesis was wrong and save the $7 million? Uh, too many people drill the budget, uh, irrespective of the results. Uh, and, you know, Tom, nobody drills their worst hole first. Uh, <laughs> you can learn from one hole and vector off it. Or, uh, or maybe doesn't release the worst hole first. Yeah, but <laughs> you get where I'm going. Uh, in other words, losing $3 million is not a good outcome. Mm -hmm. But it beats the hell out of losing 10. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm really in, interested in what will constitute success, what will constitute failure. And I'm interested, too, uh, in the sequence of unanswered questions. I say, right now, I, I know that you're not going to get exactly the yes answer that you suppose. You might get a better one. You might get a worse one. Mm -hmm. But assuming uh, that you get a yes one, uh, what's your decision train from there? Uh, what do you suggest that that data uh, will suggest in terms of your ongoing plan? Oh, yeah. And tell me uh, how much time it's going to cost to get me to a yes or a no answer. Uh, and if you don't have the money to get to a yes answer, uh, tell me where you're going to get the money. You know, too often uh, people have proposed a plan that uh, – you know, would take one and a half field seasons. So 18 months, it would take uh, $5 million, takes them a million and a half or 2 million in GNA. So they have a $7 million need and they have a million and a half in the bank. Uh, an unfunded, unanswered question is not an asset. It's a liability. Uh, it, it's okay if they tell me they're five and a half million dollars short, uh, I might put up the five and a half million in conjunction with others if I really like everything and they were honest with me. Or I might say, you find the five and a half million, you come back and talk to me later. 
uh, right now what you have is a dream, not a plan. Very different circumstance. And investors taking themselves through the sequence need to adjust their time expectations to the plan that they just heard. If answering the unanswered question, which is the catalyst that moves the share price, will take 18 months, why would the investor expect the stock to go up in three months or four months? So often, uh, investors' time expectations are unrealistic with regards to the task at hand. This isn't the company's fault. This is the investor's fault. Uh, but if I've learned anything from grading 22,000 portfolios over the last year and change, it's that the greatest flaw among speculators is that they have an imperfect sense of the time that is required uh, to make their speculation work. Uh, in other words, they set themselves up to fail because their expectations are completely irrelevant. It amuses me, actually, that many speculators think that what they want uh, matters. Uh, it's completely irrelevant uh, what you can have, <laughs> what the probability of success is, and the price you're willing to pay. Uh, the risk of failure is what matters. Mm -hmm. And and as you're saying, Rick, you know we're we really want to know um, also how to follow this story. And if if the CEO is available to to comment on that, you 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 put some importance on that of how, let's say, how reachable the CEO is, or if you have to follow the rest of the story through press releases. So tell us a bit more about how you think about that and, and maybe how, you know, what importance you place on a CEO spending, you know, less versus more time in addressing these questions to particular people. Um, in every case, um, tier one CEOs, the A players are so completely obsessed with what they do, that they don't have lives. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about baseball. Uh, they don't want to talk about popular culture. They don't want to talk about politics, except as it relates to their property. Mm -hmm. And they are absolutely flattered if you ask them questions about their company. If you are dealing with a CEO or a CFO uh, that appears to be diffident, uh, that isn't delighted that you're asking him or her questions about their company, Walk away. I, I wrote an article about this that you may be refer, referring to, uh, Nine Nosy Questions, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. uh, and I titled that one, Who's Buying the Beer? Uh, is this call hello or is this call goodbye? Mm -hmm. uh, can I call you again? If not you, who can I call? Uh, what restrictions would you put on questions that I had answered? I know that you can't give me material non-public information, uh, but what I'm asking for is plans, and these ought to be release in your proxy in your quarterly. Mm -hmm. So where am I going to get this uh, information? Who am I going to get the information from? Uh, who, if I care about the geology, is going to walk me through the cross sections? Uh, too often you uh, talk to a, a CFO uh, and the CFO sees their job as making payroll, uh, nothing else. Uh, and so if you ask them about the relationship between general and administrative expense and project expenditure uh, and how they see GNA as a percentage of project expenditure going forward, the bad CEO, the bad CFO, pardon me, will say, well, you should look at the quarterlies. Uh, in other words, I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to give you a, a basis to invest or not invest. Uh, the good CFO will say, oh, you want to get in the dirt on this? Fantastic. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've I, I've had guys that have worked for reasonable sized companies that would do things like almost describe uh, the copier lease. You know, <laughs> you want to get in the weeds? Let's get in the weeds. Absolutely. So, Rick, as we're talking about the, the capital expenditure within the company, can you walk us through some of your considerations? Like how much needs to be spent to advance these projects? Um, always timeline is very important. Let's say budget looking out six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, burn rate, and, and more importantly, their access to capital. Well, the most important thing is in a small company, where you're answering an unanswered question, uh, do they have the money to get you to a yes or a no answer? Mm -hmm. If not, where will they get it? Uh, a second thing is, are they efficient uses, users of uh, shareholders' capital? In the exploration business, if um, you know one of the Palisades juniors uh, joint ventured uh, an exploration project with, say, Newmont, 
and let's say that one of the Palisades companies was the operator of the exploration program, Newmont might allocate 12 or 15% of total project expenditures to general and administrative expense. Uh, to find out whether a junior company is efficient, you look at how GNA expenses as a percentage of total expenditures varies from 15%. Mm -hmm. We had an intern probably 10 years ago now at Sprott uh, who pulled, I think it was 25 juniors at random from the TSXV exploration companies uh, and modeled general and administrative expenses as a percentage of total expenses. And the median, pardon me, the mean in 25 companies was 65%. At a project level, the expectation is 15%. The reality among 25 juniors was 65%. Hmm. These things were salary machines. As, uh, as you can say, kind of kind of like lifestyle companies, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. don't you think that might be a function of, let's say, the size of a junior company versus the efficiency of an established bigger company like that? Like yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, but uh, that's not the company's fault. If you're stupid enough to give them money, they're going to spend it on themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that 80% uh, of the companies in the junior market are capital traps. Uh, I believe out of 2,000 listings worldwide, uh, there may be 300, 350 that are viable. It's not my fault uh, as an investor that their market capitalization uh, and their cost of capital is too low to be viable. I feel sorry for them, but I don't care. I'm not the Red Cross. Uh, at, a, at a certain level, uh, why on earth should you sacrifice your treasure for somebody else's non-viable dream? Mm -hmm. Um, you remember this, Tom, and your listeners need to remember this too. Uh, I've talked about the importance of disabusing <clears throat> yourself from narrative. Mm -hmm. When you look at the junior mining sector as a whole, if you assume that there's, what, 1,500, 2,000 listings worldwide, Australia, Canada, London, all that, if you merge them all together into one company, Junior Explore Co., that company in a very good year would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, it would lose $5 billion. Mm -hmm. So what's the net, what's the expected net present value of the junior sector? Well, how much money would you spend to lose between two and $5 billion a year? The answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. The game is to find that small percentage of companies that are so spectacularly successful that they add um, credibility and sometimes even luster to a sector that loses $4 billion a year. <laughs> Separating the, the wheat from the chaff. The expectation is failure, and you have to defend yourself from that. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, can we talk a little bit about how you how you really approach um, viewing capital structure within these companies? And let's say if you if you place um, any any uh, let's say discounting or or absolute no's based solely on capital structure, warrant overhang, anything like that. Not as much as I pay attention to the difference between my estimate of liquidation value mm -hmm. and market capitalization. Uh, what I have found is that I have made money by aligning myself uh, with people who win, lose, or draw don't sell stock. Uh, and if I'm not aligned with promoters, but rather aligned with builders, I don't have to worry about structure too much. Uh, I know with Ross Beatty as an example, if he has a hundred million shares of stock, the percentage of that that's available is flow to zero. <laughs> it's not for sale. Mm -hmm. He's going to sell it all at once. Uh, if I'm dealing, uh, you know, with somebody from the Vancouver fraud machine, uh, you know, one of the house street bandits, very different circumstance. But the truth is at age 68, I don't have time for those guys anyway. Mm -hmm. So for me, structure is less important. The structure of the balance sheet's important. Uh, I want to see some cash there. <laughs> I, I want to see an asset where enough money has been spent that I can understand its value. Uh, but you know who's done what to who's done what to who? Uh, warrant overhangs don't bother me too much because what I do, given that I'm more a speculator than a trader, um, I look at the size of the prize, that is to say, what I think a yes answer will be worth. I add in the cash from the warrant exercise, uh, and I add the warrant exercise to the market capitalization. 
I, you need to understand, Tom, that the idea that a 25 cent stock may go to 75 cents that to me has some interest, but it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, what has made me a success is that several scores of times I've had a 25 cent stock that's gone from five, gone to $5. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm, if my goal is to trade a 25 cent stock to 75 cent stock, uh, this is going to sound really elitist, but I'm, uh, I, I'm competing with the great unwashed. Uh, I'm in a world of narrative. I'm hanging around in that 80% of penny stocks that are actually worth nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that something that's worth nothing might go from 25 cents to 75 cents is to me, uh, one of the greatest irrelevancies in financial history. Uh, what I'm looking for is a 25 cent stock that is uh, perhaps potentially really uh, on the road to being a $5 stock. Uh, that's of much more interest. Now, a couple of caveats there uh, that your listeners might understand. The probability in what I do is failure. Uh, that is to say that the chance that a 25 cent stock goes to $5 is fairly skinny. So you have to accept a lot of failure on the way. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that you have to take a lot of time. Uh, I was looking back at my successes with Ross Beatty. If I remember correctly, uh, 14 starts, 13 wins. Uh, I forget how many 10 baggers, but the average 10 bagger took five or six years to occur. Uh, so I, I wasn't involved in the game for a quarter or a week. I never had trauma hold, holding stock over a long weekend. Probably more importantly, uh, during the five or six years that it took to generate tenfold successes, I experienced 50% or more share price declines at least twice, uh, which is to say I'd have a stock that went from 50 cents to two bucks. It would fall from two bucks to a buck. Uh, it would go from a buck to 375 before falling back to a buck 60. Uh, you have to have a sense of the relationship between price and value to stay these trades. Uh, if you have a sense of value, when a stock falls from $3.75 to $1.60, if you like the stock, you're delighted to see it because it wasn't for sale at $3.75, which means you're going to buy a lot more at $1.60. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, you're going to make more on the stock. That involves a certain discipline and a certain willingness to work and a certain tolerance for failure that I've learned from grading 22,000 portfolios that many speculators don't yet have, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why I continue to do interviews like this. Uh, I think if nothing else, uh, this sense of realism about the process is what I have to give back to the community. And of course, you're also very gracious in, in doing all of those reviews uh, for anybody that wants to send you their portfolio, correct? I enjoy it. Uh, I learn a lot from it. Uh, and as I say, I would be disingenuous if I wasn't willing to educate people the way I do. And by the way, this is supposed to be educational for people. Uh, you can impart a lesson to somebody uh, much more easily if they're interested. Mm -hmm. And the subject that really interests people is their own fortune. Uh, if they have their own portfolio and you're grading a portfolio and making comments on companies, it's very different than having a broader based philosophical general discussion. If you're talking about their future, uh, them being able to put their kids through college, uh, all of a sudden the lessons become uh, really intensely focused, which is great. Mm -hmm. So Rick, let's talk a little bit about the liquidity of a stock. How worried about you are, or, or how worried are you about having, you know, real liquidity in something that you're investing in or, or speculating in? Um, and, and do you think that problem tends to take care of itself once uh, hopefully it reaches that goal of going from, let's say, 25 cents to, to $5. Liquidity has two uses for me. Uh, one is an exit strategy if I'm wrong. I've already established uh, I'm not a trader or if I am, I'm lousy at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I get a no answer, uh, it, would be it would be nice if I could lose 20% as opposed to 35%. I tend mm -hmm. to take big positions. Uh, but liquidity also goes to cost of capital. Uh, a company that is liquid uh, will have an easier time raising money and they'll have an easier time attracting ultra high net worth or institutional investors. So liquidity is important to me in terms of cost of capital. 
and it's important to me as an exit strategy, but it's not particularly important to me in any other facet because I'm not a trader. I don't use the liquidity. What you're going to find and what your listeners should pay attention to is that uh, there is a new financing mechanism coming into the market, which is at the market financings, particularly in the U.S. market. And Canadian companies that are able to list in the U.S. and avail themselves of the liquidity uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, access U.S. high net worth retail, and those U.S. institutional investors that are enough dinosaurs that they won't invest outside the United States, uh, accessing that pool of capital and then using that pool of capital as Keith Newmeyer has done as an example and as Sprott does in our physical trusts to do evergreen prospectuses and at the market financings. Uh, this is a real capital revolution for the mm -hmm. mining business. And so in that sense, liquidity really goes to the cost of capital, but it has to be a special kind of liquidity. It has to be really NYSE liquidity. So Rick, when we're, when we're talking about the, um, as you just mentioned, companies that are, let's say, domiciled in Canada or the US, what considerations do you, or, or even discounts do you put on a company that isn't necessarily uh, domiciled in one of these two jurisdictions? Let's take Mexico, <clears throat> for example. Uh, listed in Mexico becomes problematic. Um, if it's not listed outside Mexico, uh, many investors won't have access to it. Uh, and there is an opacity to Mexican reporting that isn't present in Canada and the United States. Uh, I don't read Spanish well either. And uh, so just having the, the time and expense of translating uh, proxies, financial statements and income statements into English is problematic. Um, I am comfortable with AIM listings, although I don't like the market maker structure there. The, you know, the specialists there seem to specialize in raping American retail, which is unpleasant given that I'm American retail. Uh, and in, I, I love the Australian market. Uh, the Australian market is probably my favorite market in the world for many reasons, not least of which is that the hold period of the private placement in Australia is 24 hours. Um, which is certainly attractive. Uh, but I also like the direct relationship in Australia between rocks and money. Uh, too often in Canada, it goes to narrative. It's rocks to stocks and stocks to money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like the direct drive nature of Australia. I would say that in terms of the North American market, because the listing expense and the compliance expense is less in Canada, and because Canada has a well-developed infrastructure on the venture exchange that you start a company in Canada, but as soon as you get to 30 or $40 million of market cap, you certainly become DTC eligible in the US, which means that American people can buy you and participate in private placements. Uh, and as soon as you're able, uh, you list uh, either on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Directors don't like this because they don't want to be liable for U.S. securities laws. I mean, they give you all kinds of reasons why they don't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is that it mostly has to do with, yes, it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you would expect to pay more to be exposed to a 380 million per person market that's underserved in natural resources rather than being exposed to a 39 million person market that's overexposed to national, natural resources. I mean, this is simple arithmetic. So the Canadian companies that, uh, <laughs> pardon the phrase, are stuck in the Canadian extractive ghetto uh, are companies that have chosen to have permanently high cost of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a management decision. And it goes right straight to stupidity. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, one last thing I'd like to touch on about, about basically geographics, let's call it, is are you, again, more worried about the personnel that are in charge of running the company rather than the jurisdiction that say one or two of their particular projects resides in? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, people talk to me about political risk all the time. Uh, I found British Columbia as a property lender to be extremely risky. Mm -hmm. I found California to be extremely risky. Uh, I've been treated fairly well in Congo. Uh, the truth is I've been treated better in Congo than California. Mm -hmm. uh, what you find about political risk is that people who look like you and I uh, Caucasian males 
have this odd belief that money that's stolen from us uh, in English by Caucasian people, according to the rule of law, is somehow less gone. <laughs> it isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. I am much more concerned about building something that's worth stealing. Uh, you know, I'll take my chances uh, afterwards. Uh, and I'm critically interested in who runs the company. Why do I care if a government may steal something from me 10 years from now, if I'm absolutely certain that the CEO is going to steal from me this quarter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent point, Rick. So I'd like to touch on a little bit about, um, let's say, how you think about for the average, let's say, smaller net worth investor, how you want to structure a portfolio. Is there a space for um, removing risk by investing in royalty or streaming models? Um, and, and let's say maybe is there space also to be invested in as a let's say savings account, having some PSLV or something like that, physical bullion um, as part of that strategy. Let's back up, Tom. Okay. Uh, smaller investors need to be willing to invest time mm -hmm. because they can't invest treasure. So I would argue that uh, most investors shouldn't own a number of stocks that's larger than the number of hours per month that they're willing to invest understanding those stocks. Uh, the extent to which they can psychologically and financially afford risk will determine whether they have bigger companies or smaller companies uh, and how hard they're willing to work. I personally uh, don't want to give investment advice, but it's very difficult for me to understand why an investor in the United States and Canada that is exposing themselves to negative real interest rates, quantitative easing, debt and deficits wouldn't own physical gold and or silver in some fashion, be it, you know, PSLV, you know, be it our product, be it physical product. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't advocate owning those because you are anticipating capital gain. I would rather own it the way that you own life insurance or auto insurance or uh, health insurance. I would regard it as insurance against po Congress or parliament. And I believe that every North American needs insurance against the political class in the form of precious metals. What some smaller investors, if they want to be involved in the space, ought to consider is that in a resource bull market, uh, the gains that the market itself gives you are so spectacular that you, need, you don't need to outperform the index. Uh, then it becomes how much time are you willing to invest? If the answer is you're not willing to invest very much time, you buy the biggest and the best entrance in the sector. If, as an example, you look back to the gold bull market, 2000 to 2011, the metal itself went up 650%, uh, and the equities did about 50% uh, better, which means that an equity index could give you 1,000% over uh, 11 years. Do you really need to take a lot of risk to outperform the index? Uh, if you're a smaller investor, it may be worth your while to buy the five or six best companies in the index, underperform the index a little bit, uh, because the best companies do underperform the index in a bull market, but take away all the risk. Let's say that you only made 750% as opposed to 1,000% uh, over 11 years, but you did so with almost no risk and no time. Mm -hmm. Is that a horrific outcome? I don't think so. If you can, if you want to spend more time and you want to spread yourself uh, throughout the market cap sort of continuum, then I think the royalty and streaming companies are a great idea. Uh, the royalty and streaming companies are priced at a premium to market relative to EBIT, but they generate often 80% margins. Mm -hmm. uh, you would pay up for a company that's earning four or five times the margin of a different company. So the idea that uh, somebody wanted to participate in the market, wanted to take a bit more risk than owning the five or six best companies in the market, uh, owning uh, a selection of seven or eight royalty and streaming companies from the very biggest and the best, from the Wheatons uh, and the Francos, down through the higher quality intermediates, you know, a Cisco royalty would be an example, uh, down to the efficient uh, juniors, the Sandstorms, 
the Mavericks, the Altiuses, uh, the EMXs, uh, even as far down perhaps as the origins, makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. Absolute sense. Understand that you got to pay attention to the little ones. You don't have to pay so much attention to the big ones. You got to pay attention to the little ones. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Rick. So as, as we... You know, as we've allocated our capital, as we've done the work to find the biggest and best, or, or n let's not say the biggest and best, but the best investments you you think you can, how do you go about thinking about where your exit strategy is, where that exit point is to get out and, and maximize that capital, Rick? That's such a great question. You know, I always buy too early and I always sell too early. So the first part is to understand who you are mm -hmm. and accept it. Uh, I've done pretty well, not buying at the bottom and not selling at the top, taking a fat slug out of the middle. <laughs> and I accept that. Um, we talked earlier about the fact that I think a precious metals bull market is very much intact. So understanding the exit means that you understand the reason for the entrance. The reason for the entrance for me is quantitative easing, uh, debt and deficits, and negative real interest rates. If those three factors began to change, uh, that is to say, if the Canadian government and the US government stopped counterfeiting, stopped printing specious currency, I'd begin to be concerned. Uh, debt and deficits, uh, if the uh, real GDP growth in either the United States or Canada uh, began to be substantially larger than the increase in the deficit, uh, then I would begin to be concerned that we were actually amortizing the public debt and we could grow our way out of it. Uh, with regards to real interest rates, the 30-year mean real interest rate against the U.S. 10-year Treasury is 150 to 200 basis points positive. Uh, you get that by adding the positive, the, the pardon me, the nominal yield uh, to the CPI stated rate of inflation. So right now, I guess the nominally yields 175 basis points. The trailing CPI rate of inflation is 160 basis points. So if you saw the U.S. 10-year Treasury, rather than yielding 175 basis points, yielding 325 basis points, you would start to see disintermediation from gold to the U.S. 10-year Treasury. So because, I be because, the, the, because the reason, from my point of view, for precious metals and precious metal stocks to rise are particularly those three factors. If those three factors changed, I would take my exit. Mm -hmm. Now, characteristically, I miss the end of a bull, gold bull market, the, the sort of hockey stick graph. Maybe uh, the I'm, blow off top, as some call it. Yeah, I, I'm usually out before that. I'm not a good trader. <laughs> and the fact is, I've noticed, again, in Canadian parlance, the back end of that hockey stick is just as steep as the front end and a lot less fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tend not to do that, but I've done pretty well understanding myself as an investor and staying within my own guidelines. Uh, <clears throat> in industrial commodities, uh, it becomes a little different. It really becomes a probabilistic debt present value uh, question. Let's say that oil is selling as it was six months ago for $20 a barrel. You need to establish what you think is a realistic price for oil given that the International Energy Agency says that the, uh, the industry requires between $50 and $60 a barrel, including the cost of capital, to produce a barrel of oil, it, it would seem then to suggest that the price of oil uh, should normalize around $55 or $60 in uh, constant dollars. It, if you see a circumstance where the oil industry, where oil selling at twenty dollars and the the shares are priced at twenty five or thirty dollar assumption, you can be fairly certain that within two or three years the oil price is going to go up because if it doesn't, your car won't start. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you get to the point then where the oil price is say sixty dollars a barrel, then you do a probabilistic net present value. You look at Exxon, you model the future cash flows at sixty dollars. And based on that, the enterprise value of Exxon tells you whether it's cheap or it's not cheap. If the enterprise value of Exxon is $80 billion and you think the probabilistic net present value is $120 billion, probably you stay in the game or else you don't. 
Remember too, you're never going to get this right, Tom. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you just establish uh, parameters to operate in. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is not to get it perfectly right. The idea is just not to get it way wrong. Excellent point there, Rick. So as, as we're kind of wrapping up here, how do you go about you know, finding this information? Maybe tell us a little bit about um, the importance of speaking directly, let's say, with CEOs and, and people around these companies um, using resources such as yourself that, that rates uh, companies and, and maybe gives you a bit, of, a bit of a better understanding to maybe something you didn't realize. And also Edgar and Cedar, um, just kind of give us a, a, an idea of where you go about finding this information, Rick. Well, I'll let you in on a little bit of secret sauce that I just got as an old man. You know, I started ranking portfolios at 67. And I learned that uh, after many portfolio recommendations, people would ask me about companies. And I could look at the companies that they already owned uh, and tell whether that person was particularly savvy. And if I got you know, 20 or 30 people out of a 20,000 person universe who had portfolios that graded in the top decile or top quartile, by the way, I grade them all that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they asked me about companies that I hadn't heard of uh, or companies that I hadn't paid attention to. Boy, I skedaddle over there <laughs> uh, and get to understand them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have after uh, more than 45 years in the business, what used to be called a pretty good Rolodex. Uh, that is to say, uh, I know a lot of folks, I'm in contact with a lot of folks, uh, and most of our conversations seem to revolve around extractive industry investments uh, as opposed to anything else. <clears throat> uh, until very recently, too, uh, I was an employee of Sprott, which is you know 200 investment professionals worldwide, geologists, engineers, financial analysts, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had minute by minute. Uh, access to Sprott. Uh, as, a as a retired person, I have less access to that. Uh, and so I'm having to rely, although I have great relationships with all the people at Sprott, I don't have access to the proprietary data at Sprott uh, any longer. Mm -hmm. But I have a pretty good proprietary database of my own. Excellent. So Rick, uh, just to just to mention it again, uh, tell us a little bit more about Edgar and Cedar. Well, Edgar and Cedar are fantastic. Uh, uh, they are uh, respectively the Canadian uh, and American securities industry databases, where all of the information that the companies are required to file have to file it. That is to say, they're wonderful repositories. Before you and I went live, I described my investment process thirty years ago which might be to take five years of quarterly reports, take the staples out of them, uh, lay them on a very large conference table or much more commonly the floor and go month to month to month for six months. Mm -hmm. All of that information is available at Cedar uh, uh, and Edgar and you don't have to pull the staples out anymore. Uh, you can look at changing ratios between general administrative expense to total expense mm -hmm. with the click of a mouse. Now, you can pull up five years proxy statements where the management told you what they hope to accomplish and why, and look at what they did accomplish and why not. Uh, the amount of information that's available in Edgar and Cedar, if you pay attention to it, is a treasure trove. Uh, most people, including, I think, most analysts, don't pay attention to it. Uh, and the fact that they don't means that they sort of unilaterally disarm uh, in a knowledge war. <laughs> it's wonderful for those of us who care. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Rick. Well, is there uh, anything you think that I might have missed in my questions or uh, anything that you uh, would like to mention before we wrap up? Uh, this was a fairly dense interview, so there's lots more to talk about, but we may have exhausted your audience by now. I don't know how many more probabilistic net present values most people can stand uh, you know, when they have other things to do with a spring day. Uh, what I would say is I've enjoyed the process of these interviews, and I've enjoyed in particular uh, talking to the Palisade subscribers and listeners. And for people who care to talk to me more, the easiest way to do that is to go to a website, SprottUSA.com forward slash rankings, enter your natural resource portfolio, subject yourself to my rankings. They're one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. Mm -hmm. I'll comment on those companies where I think my comments might have uh, value. 
and I'll comment where I can, depending on how many inbounds I'm getting a day on any questions that you might ask me. Once again, SprottUSA.com forward slash rankings. Excellent, Rick. Well, we really, really appreciate your time and, and your views and, uh, you know, sharing that that education um, from a from uh, somebody with as much experience in this industry as, as you have. We really appreciate it, Rick. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.